What I've learned as I've gotten older is that things get more complicated as you grow up. When I was a kid, it was very clearly marked in my TV shows, my cartoons, who was the good guy and who was the bad guy, right? And the bad guy was bad, and he did bad things, and you didn't have to have any sympathy for the bad guy. And now they make really complicated villains in movies and TV shows. We're like, ah, I don't like what he's doing, but I totally get it. I understand why he feels that way. It's, it's, there are some things that are good and some things that are bad, and it's very clearly marked. But then as I've gotten older, I've realized there are some things that that line is a little grayer, right? There are good kinds of pain in our lives. When you care about somebody and you love them, and they go away for a while, you're like, I miss them. I miss them. Or when you're, when you're working out and it starts to hurt, you're like, oh, that's a good burn. That's a good burn. No, I don't feel that way at all, but I know some people do. There's no such thing. Or like even pain when it's warning you against something. You touch your hand to the stove, it's hot, you pull your hand back. Yes, you have a burn, but it's not as bad as it could have been if you didn't have pain. Something else I've learned uh, that apparently has good and bad versions is cholesterol. <laughs> apparently there's good cholesterol and bad cholesterol, which doctors, come on, you couldn't have thought of like another term for like the good cholesterol so we can have it clearly earmarked? No. It's good cholesterol and bad cholesterol, and pride is a lot like that. There are some things that it's good to be proud of. If I'm proud of my kids, that's a good thing. You're like, yeah, you should be proud of your kids, and they should know that you're proud of them. If I paint a painting as like a hobby, and I'm like, what do you think? Like, I'm kind of proud of this. You'd be like, yeah, it's good to be proud of something like that. But if I'm proud of my bank account, I've suddenly crossed a line. I'm like, eh, that's the wrong kind of pride, Travis. Or if I'm proud of something and I make it really known to you that I'm proud of it, that's the wrong kind of pride. And so what I want us to do today is I want us to look at the scriptures and I want us to talk about how we can navigate being followers of Jesus and dealing with this thing called pride because it's incredibly prevalent in our lives and our culture kind of tells us there's some things to be proud of, some things not to. What does the Bible say and what does God want from us as we pursue him? How do we navigate pride. We're going to be in Galatians chapter 5 verse 26. We're going to go through 610 and because I've already picked on doctors, we're going to diagnose pride. I'm going to lay out a treatment plan for you and then we're going to talk about what a life without pride looks like. So first let's talk about the symptoms of pride. Let's start by diagnosing ourselves and we'll diagnose ourselves much like going to the doctor by asking you a series of questions based on the text. The first question looking at the symptoms of pride. Am I antagonistic? Verse 26, let us not become conceited, provoking one another and envying one another. So this is kind of the unholy trinity of pride, conceit, provocation, and envy, right? Conceit is this thing where you don't really have any substance behind your pride. It's just kind of empty or vapid. And then, because you're empty and vapid and insecure in this area, you're trying to cover it up, you become provocative. So you criticize people, you ridicule people, like the schoolyard bully, right, pushes people down on the playground. Now in our culture, we usually don't directly uh, uh, ridicule people, we talk about them behind their backs, right? We criticize them so other people look negatively. And if you can't tear somebody down that way, well, then you just get envious. You just get grumpy about it. And that's ultimately what pride is. Pride is a possessive, fragile thing. It wants what other people have. C.S. Lewis said something to the effect of pride is, is a competitive thing. I don't just want something, I want more of it than somebody else has. So are you antagonistic? Are you provoking people? Are you envious? And you might have a problem with pride, but let's keep going. How do I respond to somebody else's failures? Verse one, 
Brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Keep watch on yourself, lest you too be tempted. Bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. Now, when you read this on first blush, it sounds like Paul's telling us, if you see somebody struggle with like drinking, you should be really careful and not go to the bar because you yourself may accidentally have alcohol put in you. Now, obviously, if you struggle with alcoholism, that's different. But we read this as this big, like if somebody fails, we need to pull ourselves way back because we could be sucked into some kind of vortex of sin with them and just go down the drain with them. And so we wind up just cutting ourselves off from people. That's not what the passage is saying. There's a much greater temptation that we don't even pay attention to that this passage is speaking of. Because when somebody fails in church circles, the greatest temptation that we have is to judge them, is to look down on them, is to condemn them, to say, well, they deserve that, or man. You see, we don't bear our our wounded up. We tend to eat our wounded. We tend to cast them aside. We want to travel light. We don't see them as ones to be encouraged or mended or bound up. We certainly don't want them around as reminders that we are just as capable of failing as they are. So how do you respond to the failures of another? Are you relieved? Do you feel better about yourself because somebody messed up? Do you think, I'm not that bad? I thought the bar was up here, but if they messed up, the bar's kind of down here now. Do you gloat? Do you think to yourself, ha, I knew they weren't that good. Nobody could be that perfect, and I knew it. Do you get angry? Some righteous indignation is probably warranted in certain situations. But do you get mad at the person where you're like, they are making us look bad? We do this with our kids all the time, right? you're embarrassing me in this store because the people in Target are so concerned, (laughs) right? Or it's a part of an organization, right? We have politicians that fail and we're like, oh man, the midterms are coming up. You had to have that scandal right now. Or how about in the church? Had a number of failings recently around the church world in our denomination. Do we just get mad at them? making the name of Christ look bad. Trust me, he is perfectly capable of defending his own name. Do you try to take on their burdens? Now, I know in some cases, you might be too far removed to take on those burdens yourself. But do you at least pray for that person, honestly and sincerely? Do you look to them and and, and lift them up? At the very least, do you see their life as a caution in your own saying that could just as easily happen to me. No, often what we do is like, well, I could never screw up that bad. You have something inside of you that every single person who has ever messed up has inside of them, and it's called sin. And if you think there are some failings to which you are immune, you don't understand sin. And that means you may not understand grace. You are just as capable of every kind of heinous thing that anybody has ever done because of sin. The right circumstances, the right need in your life could lead you down that path as well. What do you do? How do you respond when somebody fails? Another diagnostic question, what do I think about myself? The classic question, verse 3, for if anyone thinks he is something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. I've said this before, humility is the proper perspective of how things are. That's why Paul says, if somebody thinks of of himself when he's nothing, then he's self-deceived. This is not humility, right? Humility is properly understanding the way things are. And the problem with pride is it's incredibly self-deceiving. Most people will say, if I were to say how many of you struggle with pride, you'd probably all raise your hands, right? But how many of us actually do anything about it? How many of us actually confess it? Or do we wait until we are humbled? You see, that's because pride is self-deluding. It it, it lies to us. We lie about ourselves. We're not as caught up in pride as we think we are. This is why you need community. This is why you need people in your life. 
When I was growing up, and I don't know why my, my dad did this, when we were driving down the interstate, my dad would ask my mom, could he get over? I'm like, Dad, I think you can probably check the rearview mirrors and stuff like that. But that was just the way he did it. And, and you know what? Like having a second set of eyes when you're going 80 miles an hour is probably not the worst idea. You need to have people around you who you're able to ask questions. Hey, am I, I feel like I'm, am I prideful here? You've got to, you've got to, am I? And give them these questions and be like, hey, do you see this in me? Call me out on it. Call me out when I'm critical. Call me out when I'm uh, judging other people because it's pride and, I, and you're not going to get it out of your own life. This is why you need a connect group. This is why you need a small group. This is why you need to go to the grow ministries. This is why. Because there are things in your life you will not catch on your own. And if you think you can, guess what? It's pride. And you're self-deluded. Do I blame other people? Verse 4. But let each one test his own work, and then his reason to boast will be in himself alone and not in his neighbor. For each will have to bear his own load. Now, this seems to contradict what Paul just said. And it seems to contradict everything the Bible says about boasting. So what are we dealing with here? Because the Bible never tells us to boast in our own work, except for right here. And Paul literally just said, we need to carry one another's burdens. And now he's saying, we've got to carry our own burden. And there's no Greek gymnastics I can do here. It's literally the same word. Burden, burden, same word. So what's going on? Let's start with boasting. Often we compare ourselves to other people, right? That's the way in which we find it easiest to boast, right? I ran uh, the Tour de Floor back in 2017, and I keep saying I need to run it again so I can update my hat, because I just have a hat that says 2017, and it just seems kind of lame. It's like, wow, you ran that like five years ago, Travis. But I ran it, and I remember looking at my times, and I was, I was not anywhere close to being the fastest. But I looked, and I was like, oh, I did pretty good for my age group, or I did pretty good for, like, my demographic, right? I was comparing myself to other people. And we do this with our goodness, with our morality. Well, we're pretty good for pick your group. But see, God's standard is absolute. God's, God's standard is there's no curve. God does not grade on a curve. God has an absolute standard. And if we fail to meet it, we are not good. And this gets us to the idea of bearing our burdens and bearing our own burdens. Because one of the things we find most prideful in ourselves is our ability to carry our own load. The ability to, to pull ourselves up by our bootstraps, right? Let me ask you this, when you have a problem who do you go to? Are you somebody that receives the burdens of other people or are you somebody that views your problems as more important than other people's problems? And probably the best way to test this is if you are a person of prayer, if you pray a lot, when you pray, do you pray about your problems more than you pray about other people's problems? Everybody is going to have to answer for what they've done. And do you constantly unload your burdens on other people? Do you blame other people for the problems in your life? How do you deal with your problems and the problems of other people? Pride is an insidious thing. And if you answered yes to one or more question, then as the doctor in this role, I'm going to have to diagnose you with pride and I'm pretty sure it's a pandemic. So what do we do? What's the solution to pride? Let's talk about that. Verse six, let the one who has taught the word share all good things with the one who teaches. Do not be deceived, God is not mocked for whatever one sows, that will he also reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption, but the one who sows to the spirit will from the spirit reap eternal life. So what I want us to do is I want to condense this down because Paul is applying the idea of burdens very specifically to the church at Galatia. He's saying, basically, y'all need to take care of the people who are taking care of you. The church is designed to work together. And he brings up 
this reaping and sowing language, which is very prominent in Scripture, so much so that we're kind of taking a week off next week from Galatians just to talk about reaping and sowing and how it appears in Scripture, which I think is a really cool thing to do. Uh, If you were in a commentary, it'd be called an excursus, which is a super fun big word. But for the sake of time, let's just condense this down and talk about what reaping and sowing is. We tend, and in the context of the passage, we tend to reap and sow into other people's lives. Your burdens, your, your, your problems, your concerns spill over into other people's lives and their problems, concerns spill over into your lives and we sow into other people's lives while we sow into ours and then we reap out of other people's lives because we're so interconnected. One of the ways we say this and we do this in other, other things, sorry. We, we say this in to, to, to work, to school, to professions, to, to wealth, right? We, we, we reap what you sow. You reap what you sow. We say this a lot. We have other variations of it as well. You get out of it what you put in, right? You, uh, you get what you pay for. You get back what you give. What goes around comes around. And you couple this with what's said about burdens and carrying your own burden and carrying the burden of other people. And you realize that a lot of the things that we're proud of in our lives are things that we have sown into our lives. Right? Like the things I'm proudest of are the things I've worked hard for. My education, my career, my family. We're proud of our titles and our neighborhoods and our things because we've worked hard for them probably. Or you've sowed, you've worked really hard with your family and want to have a good picture perfect family and you're proud of them. Or maybe you've sowed into your appearance, your health. And so you're proud of your body, you're proud of the way you look and and you maintain that. But here's the thing, the things that we sow to be proud of can also reap a harvest of shame later on. Because bad business moves and you can lose those things that you're most proud of. Our kids can very easily go from pride and joy to black sheep like that, to where we don't want to talk about them and we're ashamed. Unfortunately, beauty and health give way to the slow march of time. And you look in the mirror and you miss the face that used to stare back at you and the body that used to look back at you. In order for something to be a point of pride, yes, you have to work hard at it. But in order for it to remain that and not to become a source of shame, you have to keep working at it. And then there are things in our lives that have never been points of pride, but they've also been sown into our lives. Things that we're ashamed of have been sown into our lives, either by ourselves or by other people, right? We've got things, mistakes that we made in our past, and we're ashamed of it. We don't want to talk about it, right? Or maybe it was something that was put in our lives by other people. You had a bad upbringing. Or you were abused, and even though you've been to counseling, or you, you know that people have said, oh, it's not your fault, you still can't shake the shame that so often accompanies the abused. Maybe there's a past relationship. Maybe there's a past church. Maybe there's a past life that you've left somewhere else in another church, in another uh, place, in another time. And yet like a ghost, it haunts you, this shame that you've sown and now you've reaped it. You see, pride and shame are twin burdens and every single one of us carries them around and we're constantly shifting the pride and the shame that we carry. We shift it so the pride, the things we're proud of, is displayed more prominently. And the burden of shame is shoved so far down into the pack that you've got to dig a while and get to know us or get to know people that knew us way back when to even remotely get close to the things we're ashamed of. And here's the truth that I want to tell you today about pride and shame, these twin burdens that you can't get rid of, is you will never, ever, Approach the throne of God burdened by pride and shame. And here's why. If you are burdened by shame, you will not approach God because you will not think that you need to. I don't need him. Or 
you will want to approach the throne of God on your terms. God, I can handle this, I can't handle that. And so in your pride, you'll want to dictate the terms of the relationship with the Almighty. Shame, unfortunately, has another reason why we don't go to the throne of God. It's because your shame reminds you of a lie that you will not be accepted when you go to the throne. And so we've reaped and sowed these two things that keep us away from God the Father. So what do we do? Well, fortunately, we find a truth in another passage in 1 Corinthians 15. It'll be on the screen. Verse 42, so it is with the resurrection of the dead. What is sown is perishable, what is raised is imperishable. It is sown in dishonor, it is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness, it is raised in power. It is sown a natural body, it is raised a spiritual body. If there is a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. See, what Paul's talking about here is there uh, will be a time, there was a time, excuse me, when people died, and this still takes place today, we put bodies in the ground, right? When somebody dies, their corpse goes into the ground. And it's like sowing a seed. They're planted. And when Christ returns, whether you're a believer or not, your body will be physically raised from the dead. And your soul will be reunited with that body. And at the end of all things, when Christ is returned, there will be a new heaven and a new earth. And those who have trusted in Christ will live forever in a new body and a new heaven and a new earth. And those who have not will be separated eternally. And that's, that's the end of all things. And notice what is said about this new body, this glorified body that believers have. It is sown, it is put in the ground in dishonor and in weakness. It is raised in glory, it's raised in power. All those things we hate about shame, the dishonor, the way it makes us feel weak, it goes into the ground and it stays there. And notice all the things that pride hopes to give us, glory and power. They're freely given to us by God in Christ when we're raised to life. And the way this is, the reason why it has to be this way is because this is what happened to Christ. He carried our burdens, those twin burdens of pride and shame, those things that keep us from God. He carried them like burdens because he didn't have his own burdens to carry. He carried ours and he took them with him, with the cross, up to the hill outside of Jerusalem and he was crucified there for our burdens. He let our burdens put him in the ground so that we can be free of them, so that we can come to the throne. He let them crush him so that we could be free of them. And he offers this to you, eternal life, free of pride, but free of shame. And all he asks of you to do is to take the burdens off, to lay them aside. That's what faith is. That's what coming to Christ is. That's what entering into a relationship with Christ is. You take to him the things that you think you're most proud of and the things you're most ashamed of. And you say, Lord Jesus, I can't carry these anymore. I can't maintain this image that everybody thinks of me. And I don't want anybody to find out about this awful thing. And you give them to him. You take those burdens off and he shoulders them and he takes them to the cross. And now you're free. And part of being a follower of Christ, that's justification. Being sanctified is you have this annoying thing that happens where you keep finding areas of your life where you're still proud, you're still ashamed, and you continually go back again and again and again and say, oh, Lord, I found another burden I was carrying. And he says, I'll take it. Give it to me. Because what does he say in Matthew 11? Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, And I will give you what? Rest. Rest. Do you want rest from the burdens of pride and shame? The only reason, the only reason why anybody would ever say no to that question is because you're too proud. Lay the burdens aside. Give them to him. And let him set you free. So how do we know? If I let go of pride, what does my life look like? Verse 9, and let us not grow weary of doing good, for in due season we will reap if we do not give up. So then as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone and especially those who are of the household of faith. 
All right, I'd really love to give you some deep and rich exposition of this passage, but it's so straightforward that I really don't need to. As you grow closer to Christ, as you lay aside the burdens of pride and shame at his feet and he takes them, you will start to do good. You will do good in your life, you will do good to other people, and you will do good especially to the body of believers. That's it. Which is great. But can I tell you something? Can I be confessional for a moment about doing good for other people? You know what I find really annoying about serving other people? There's some things that I find super annoying about serving other people. You do too, okay? You just haven't said it yet. One of the annoying things I find about serving other people is that when I am serving them, I am thinking a whole lot about me. Yes, I'm thinking about like all the things I could be doing, right? Like, well, I could have cut the grass, but here I am. I'm gonna have to do this later, right? We think a lot about sometimes what we get out of it by serving, right? So when you give your offering, when you give your gift to the church, you're like, man, I better get that statement at the end of the year so I can have a tax write-off. What do I get out of this? Oh, well, our friends are going to serve too, so I won't be by myself. I won't be the only person there, right? Sometimes we like to get seen serving. We like to feel like a good person. Well, I volunteer in this area, and and I really serve because it makes me feel good. There's nothing wrong with that, I guess, but it's kind of self-interested, I suppose. My favorite one, and we've all said this, okay? So I know I'm going to step on some toes, but we've all said this. When you come back from a trip or a service project and you say, you know what, we went there to bless them, but they wound up blessing us first. (laughs) Everybody said it. That's why we're laughing. For a people that genuinely, and I do believe this about our church, I do genuinely believe we want to serve and help our community. That's without a question. It's one of the things I love about this place. But we think a lot about ourselves while we're doing it. And I think a life without pride probably isn't doing that as much. Jeff has quoted this before at C.S. Lewis, humility is not thinking less of yourself, it's thinking of yourself less. That's true. If you want to know how deep the roots of Christ's love and affection have gone in your life, and you want to know whether pride is a problem, I could have boiled the whole first part down to one question, is when something happens, and I mean anything in your life happens, is your first question, how does this affect me, or some variation of that? And if it is, pride's a problem. Pride's a problem. So how do we cultivate a world in which we are not proud? in which we are not the center of our own universe because the culture around us kind of wants us to be that way. Well, the first thing is you need to know something about human beings. You are not capable of stopping thinking about yourself unless you replace it with something else. So when you are compelled to think of yourself, like those burdens, those pride and the shame and all that, you have to think of Christ. You have to remember who he is. You have to remember what he did. You have to reflect and meditate and remember what he did. This is why we take the Lord's Supper once a month, so we can remember what he did. So if you got homework this week, I want everybody to do this this week. I want you to find a nice, quiet spot. Someplace nice, someplace quiet, someplace cool. Close your eyes, and I want you to relax in Jesus Christ. I want you to rest in him. I want you to, it doesn't even have to like come forward in in praise and worship, it can. But just take a deep breath, those of you who are in Christ, and rest in the fact that your Savior loves you. And if you don't have that confidence, that's something we need to talk about. Because there's a pride or shame problem in there somewhere. We need to root that out. But do that this week. But then from there, as you rest in Christ, as you draw close to him, you'll also be drawn to other people's burdens because Jesus' life on earth was one of being constantly drawn to people who were burdened. You can't see? Let me fix that. You can't hear? Let me fix that. Is everybody hungry? Let me help you do that and then take home leftovers with you. You've got a problem with pride and shame. Let me take that to the cross for you. His whole life was one of burden carrying and he sought them out. And this is what he does in our lives. As you grow closer to Jesus Christ, you start hunting down people's burdens, almost preemptively, taking on their struggles, taking on their issues on your own shoulders. And you're trusting God to take care of your problems through his grace and his sovereignty. 
and you keep hunting down burdens. And I know what some of us will say, because I struggle with this too. Well, Travis, where's the boundary? Where do we, where do we say no? If I, if I stretch myself too thin, it'll kill me. That's the idea. Because the closer you grow to Christ, who allowed our burdens to kill him, you will find that you will take on more and more burdens and it will cost you something. But many of us aren't willing to even go so far as to find out what it'll cost, much less give it up. Brothers and sisters, please draw close to the Lord in Christ. Draw close to him. And then do not resist that compulsion that you will feel to lay down your life for other people. Take on other burdens. Let them crush you. Odds are they won't really do that. Odds are you'll give up a Saturday or a Sunday or an hour of worship. But let other people's burdens become more important than your own. And that's what a life without pride looks like. Today we've diagnosed ourselves, and I think it's unanimous. I think we all struggle a little bit with pride, probably a lot of bit with pride. But there is a Savior who loves us despite our constant claims to his position as God over everything. Lay down your burdens, lay down your shame, lay down your pride. And when you are free, find other people's burdens and lay them, take them on so you can lay them down too. Let's pray. Gracious God and Heavenly Father, thank you for the grace that you have given us today to come before you and admit the fact that we are proud. Way more than we know. Lord, I pray that you would set us free from our twin burdens. Though we might be more free, both to enjoy you and to worship and to love other people well. And it's in your great name we pray. Amen.